Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. Not today, Satan. Not today. And Dale Hummel. Be who you are and say what you feel, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel alongside co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, everyone. Ryan, I had a great weekend. I hope I hope you enjoyed your weekend as, as much as I did. Well, I was with you. How could I not enjoy it? Exactly. Other than we, we did take some detours trying to find some produce and fresh food that, that wasn't available on a Sunday in Amish country, but we, we did try. You did not run over a horse and buggy, so we're fine. We are, are, we are fine. It, it was good, and, and uh, I appreciate uh, having some time to, to spend with you, and I, I, I especially enjoyed judging alongside you and having my daughter Tara in the ring to, to assist in sorting the goats. But it was not only uh, an enter- entertaining time, but, but educational, just listening to you describe livestock, Ryan. I, I enjoy it. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dale. I thought that uh, you were very colorful as well, not in your attire, but in the words that you use to describe the animals. And I was very impressed with how passionate and appreciative you were with the showmen at that show. I did not get to judge showmanship. They did that on Saturday, but you did. And you were very, very impressive and blown away by the quality of the showmen there. And so that that was a lot of fun to get to listen to you. I did think that, you know, when you gave your little speech about where we were in America today, you were making fun of me for joking with about you on the mic. But when you said that you never speak your mind and all this, you know, I did think, okay, I'm glad it's not raining and thundering here because we're going to electricity going to strike us all down. <laughs> and 10 minutes after you gave that address, the rain came. So God was listening. God was listening. Now, the the point I was trying to make, and and I do speak my mind to you, but in general, I've been, for the most part, politically silent. And I was trying to bring across the point that the silent majority that has gotten across in the past for many years, and we don't have to speak out on social media, we maybe don't have to speak our opinion or push that very hard out there into the public. But at this point, when the very loud extreme fraction of our society is speaking up and screaming, it appears as though the politicians are listening to them, even though they don't hold a large portion or a large number. And they're, they're the ones that are the, the most extreme. And it concerns me. And I guess I was trying to, to get the point across that, hey, it's time that, that we speak up and, and we have no choice. We have to be heard. We're at that turning point that it has me nervous. Just what we talk about here each week. Oh, there's no doubt we need to be nervous. I mean, there is stuff going on in this world right now that just, it cannot stand and it cannot go unchecked. And I get that a lot of people are, I don't want to say the word afraid, but they just don't like controversy and they don't, they have their beliefs and they like to keep them to themselves. And, you know, they will hopefully at least express those beliefs at the ballot box. But this is more than about who's going to be your political leader or the president or your representative. This is about our way of life and our liberties and our freedoms. And they are all in question right now. And I cannot agree with you anymore on this subject. People have to speak up because the ones that are talking are being very, very loud, and they are getting their points heard, and there is no one fighting them on the issue. There is no one standing up for the other side, and it's got to change, or we're going to see changes that not a whole lot of us like. No, and I, I see political polarization has gone to new levels. I think if if we look at history, every great civilization eventually falters. And unless we put our big boy pants on as a country and work in the same direction, we may follow exactly what history has proven. This concerns me. And when we have politicians and the mainstream media that are more concerned about pushing this polarization and and pushing us apart and doing what they need to in their own self-interest, it is all bringing our country to its knees. 
and I'm I'm genuinely concerned about it. It is more than than just about who's going to be our next president. It's going to touch each and every one of us. No, oh. if it hasn't touched you already in some way, then you literally are tone deaf and blind. I mean, that's just it's the, only two explanations for it. It's not just one issue. It's just it's not just George Floyd and police reform. It, it is gone so far past all of that. And I do think that was the tip-off point. But we're not even talking about that man or his death anymore. That's not going to come up again until the trial. This is about things like getting, like, this whole chop nonsense. That mayor has allowed this to go on for, I don't it's got to be close to a month or not. And in the past week, all she has done is ask these people to leave. Ask them. How does she think that's going to accomplish anything? Another person has been shot and killed there. She made another plea and basically explained to the media that she wants to to settle this peacefully. And that's great. But I, I, I'm not, it just doesn't seem to be happening. How many more days are we going to, like, is there a timeline when the peace offering runs out? There are people that live there that have nothing to do with these idiots that cannot go to work, be outside their apartment buildings, etc., and feel safe because she has let these idiots take over. She has. And let's look at the bigger picture. Think about World War One, World War II, this, or a pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic. In my mind, this was the perfect environment when we were attacked as a country from a Chinese virus why would we not come together as a country, the political parties, all of that to defeat this enemy? We've done it before, but I'm afraid we've gotten to the point in our political system that it cannot be done anymore. And we've got total chaos going on. We're defunding the police. We're allowing the, the chop zones. All of these things are hard for me to even wrap my head around. I was on the phone this morning visiting with a good friend in Canada. Here in late July, Canada is going to open their border up to nearly 15 European countries, but not the United States. Europe, in turn, is opening up their borders to several other countries, including China, but not the United States. So we're rewarding China for all their bad behavior. But do you want to know why they are doing that? I would like to know why. It is very, very, very simple. All these other countries, the 15 that are going to get opened up to Canada and European nation, they don't have every single one of their mainstream media outlets on there pointing out every horrible thing that is happening doing to deal with this pandemic every five seconds like we do in America because they don't want Trump to win re-election. No, we're, we're testing more. We're shining the spotlight on it harder, just as you're stating. And that, that is why you're right. It's It has no realistic, logical base to it outside of the attention that's being brought to it. We have tested, it's like 30 million something people now. I don't know how many of these other countries are testing. But like the only thing that I am racist or prejudiced against is ignorance. Now, if you go out there and give 30 million people an IQ test, you're going to figure out that the, there's a whole lot more idiots in the world than what you thought too. This is the same <laughs> way with Miss Rona. I, I agree with that. And this was a topic I was going to avoid, but, but China came up and, and, I, and I, can't, I can't not speak on it. If you look at the past 20 years, China is a place nearly every pandemic has originated. And there's a lot of theories out there that they're trying to develop viruses as biological weapons or to use in biological warfare. I don't know if they are or not. I have no doubt they're probably experimenting with different viruses that maybe they should not and and shouldn't be on the radar. But think of it this way. If they were to develop, or any country, a strain of virus that is both lethal and highly contagious, that has not been encountered in the past, so we have no vaccine, we have no therapeutics, in theory, they could mass produce a vaccine prior to ever turning this loose on the world. War is no longer about planes, ships, or to some degree, even nuclear weapons. It's more about cyber warfare, 
And God help us if our country or another country decides to jump into viral warfare. I have not heard this discussed anywhere. I lay awake at night trying to figure out what what could be done to prevent something like this. And I don't have an answer for it. So if if China is experimenting in that and these viruses such as COVID-19 have, have arrived or derived from such, that is a problem. But let's say China's not doing any experimenting. The pandemic and the viruses are still initiated there or originating there. The wet markets and consumption of wild animals combined with zero regard for what products and what feed they give to their commercial hog productions is reckless. And it will continue to bring issues to all of us in the world. It is this extreme level of carelessness. And it just doesn't matter. Everything, whether it's experimental viruses in a laboratory that have somehow gotten loose by accident, released on purpose, or simply the carelessness in the livestock production system over there and their lack of biosecurity and lack of any form of intelligent restrictions on feed resources. This is going to continue, and I'm not going to go into it right now because we don't need any more negative news, but there's another form of H1N1 that has never been seen before in China right now that has spread from a hog to a packing plant worker where it does not appear there's human-to-human spread, but you know what it takes for that to happen is a simple mutation. So again, I'm not trying to say the sky is falling or anything like that. This may not be anything and it never spreads from human to human. But the fact is these things and their lifestyle and the way they manage their livestock, their wet markets, everything involved, these things are going to continue to pop up in one of these days, more times I'm afraid than not, it's going to go human to human. And then all of a sudden it's our problem. Everything you're saying is spot on. Get the Bible out, put your hand on and say, amen. I still think the bigger issue in all of this is it doesn't matter if it is Miss Rona or George Floyd or some new pandemic or anything like that in our country. The problem is right now that the media outlets are choosing to focus on absolutely everything that is negative and wrong about the world and that people can get fired up and have a problem with because they do not want Trump to get reelected. And y'all may say that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but here's my point. Rona comes out. That's all we talk about. Rona starts decreasing. Things start opening up. The economy starts coming back. Jobs numbers go up. So then we have George Floyd. George Floyd deal runs its course because now we're waiting on the trial. So then we come up with something else. We come up with Black Lives Matter, and we're going to riot and loot and focus and all that. That kind of dies down. We're back to Miss Rona. It just blows me away that people cannot see through this. It is it is difficult, and each one of us has a vote. And we had had the conversation with my my friend that is originally from Argentina and now in Canada. He was telling me this morning how he's always looked up to the United States from the time he was a young child as a perfect democracy. And he would tell you now, because of exactly what Ryan's talking about with the focus of the mainstream media and the political polarization that is a result of such, that he is in fear that the perfect democracy is maybe not as perfect right now as it's once been. And, and it isn't. It, it just is what it is. I put up a post about speaking your truth a week ago, two weeks ago. I don't know. They all run together at some point, but like that and that needed to be out there and that needs to happen. And it, it, we all need to speak what we think right now, just like you alluded at the beginning. But a lot of people reached out to me and they're like, what happens if Trump wins? The better question is what happens if Trump doesn't win? Because either way, It's going to cause drama and it's going to be controversial and one half is going to be happy. The other half is not. But I promise you, if he does not win, we as a country are going to be way, way worse off than I think they can 
even contemplate in so many areas. And my biggest fear is that if he doesn't win, because we are pretty much split 50-50. The half that did want him to win, that's been quiet when he was running for president, when he won president, while he's been president, if he gets beat, they're going to wake up and it's going to be ugly. You're you're absolutely correct. And I, I don't know what, what more to do and, and we'll see what, what happens this fall, but it makes me nervous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn our current events before we jump into an incredible topic here. I'm going to go back to our Ohio show real quick and, and, and maybe explain to the listeners just a little bit more. So my daughter and I are driving through Ohio and we stopped to visit a client and Ryan asked if we could pick him up at the airport. So we, we pick him up a little bit after nine o'clock in Columbus and head towards Millersburg for the show. Um, get in a little bit late and we decide, okay, what time are we heading out in the morning? I was under the presumption that the show was starting at 10 when it turns out it was actually 1030. But it's good that we we showed up early because we get there a little before 10. And Ryan, what, what proceeds to happen? Do you remember? Dale, the same thing happens that happens at every show. And it, I, it, I like don't know why it happens, but it is very humbling. And it's very cute, and I appreciate it. But the virtual cattle battle show was based out of Ohio, so a lot of those kids brought their banners from the virtual cattle battle show, and I signed them and took a lot of pictures. And Dale just thought it was just the greatest thing ever because he knows <laughs> I get embarrassed by it. I mean, I like doing it and everything, but I don't understand why they want me to take pictures with them. I mean, I I do I do like doing it. I just don't understand why. They want this to happen, but Dale knows that, and he knows that I get embarrassed by it, and so he loved to see it happen. It, it, in all seriousness, Ryan, and, and that was the first time I had been there in person to watch it, and those those young kids, these were kids, guys, that showed in a virtual show a month ago. They didn't have goats there. They didn't have pigs there. There wasn't a cattle show going on. They came there specifically to meet Ryan to get his autograph, to get a picture with him. And in all seriousness, Ryan, I watched those those young kids and, and their parents, and, and they were truly excited to be able to do it. And and I, I do find it entertaining, and I like to give you a hard time about it. But that that's 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 impressive that that you take the time and 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 give those those kids attention. And I don't know how you do it, but each one of those kids that came up, Ryan, and this was not a real live show; it was a virtual show. He'll remember what they're wearing or something about them, and. That means that means a great deal to those young people, and, and I appreciate that. So once the show starts, there's a, two rings. Ryan and I are sharing a speaker system, different microphones, but sharing a speaker system. So we're occasionally waiting on each other to talk, and I'm I'm sorting a class of does, I believe, and and uh, I hear Ryan begins to to talk a class, and as I'm sorting this class, I hear Ryan come up in in something. I don't know if it's second or third or, or where it was, but he says, and next out is is Big booty Judy, that if we could just change her tires, we could move her up in class. And I'm thinking, this is impossible. How how am I going to entertain and come up with some of the terminology that that Ryan actually uses on the microphone? And it's it's impressive, Ryan. And and I I think because you can describe those stocks so accurately and entertain those people around the ring, we're used to going to shows and educating. And learning what that that judge has to say and trying to to listen to what he's saying and apply it to those stock, you do that very well. And at the same time, you bring an inner entertaining aspect to it. And guess what? That's why those kids like to to come up and, and visit with you and get a selfie. And it's it's impressive. And I I do like to give you a hard time, but I haven't been at a show with you live in a long time or had a chance to listen to you. And and it was it was a privilege. And and part of the reason I took my daughter to the show is, is so she could listen to you and, and listen to how you put words together. And, and those things uh, absolutely impressed me, Ryan. Oh, well, thank you, Dale. That's so sweet of you. Tara will be just fine as long as she doesn't listen to you. But to, <laughs> I really do appreciate everything that you said. And to all those kids out there, y'all come up. And if you just want to talk, I, it doesn't matter if you want a picture or whatever. I am just a normal person. I know people don't think I am, but I really am just a normal person. And I I, I do love meeting every single one of y'all. And it really is very, very humbling for me. But I 
I do appreciate it more than you ever know. So the next show I'm at, if you're there, don't be afraid. Just come on up and introduce yourself and we'll have a little chat. And Ryan, I, I look forward to the next show that we can possibly sort together ring by ring because it, it, I actually enjoyed, I had fun at the show more so than, than normal and, it, and it's good. Well, you have to get out there and judge Mordell. I know you took a hiatus there for a while, but uh, I'm just being as honest as I can be. There are not a whole lot of people that do this at all levels that are as knowledgeable and most importantly, as honest in their opinions as you are in all species. And so Tara, and the one thing that Tara and I, we agreed on a lot, but the one thing that we agreed on most of is you really have to get back out there and judge more shows. Well, we'll, we'll see if, if time allows. And, and I did enjoy it and, and we'll probably go that, that direction a little bit more. Do we have any more current events before we get to our, our livestock topic at hand? No, I, we need to move on to something positive because, Lord, it's a wreck. <laughs> okay, we will do just that. Ryan, today we're going to focus on the history of the cattle show ring with an Angus twist. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to have Mr. Tom Burke with us. Ryan, we, we're about to make history recording a true livestock legend. Tom comes to us from the American Angus Hall of Fame the World Angus Headquarters in Smithville, Missouri. I do not know where to begin. Tom was born into a fourth-generation Angus operation in the state of Minnesota. As far as I can tell, Tom has been studying Angus cattle, promoting Angus cattle since the day he was born. Tom has been in the Angus sale management business for more than 50 years, managing close to 9,000 registered Angus sales. In 2017, Tom was inducted into the Saddle and Sirloin Club. This is an honor that few of the great leaders in our industry have received. As true of an honor as anything I can think of within this industry. He's been heavily involved in the Suffolk sheep business. I believe judged the North American Livestock Exposition Suffolk show at least once. Been a strong sheep enthusiast for, for many years. I could go on further about Tom's awards and accomplishments, but I want to visit with Tom and, and let him tell some of the story. But before I do that, I was going to bring up that Tom and I had the chance, or I had the privilege, to join Tom in Palermo, Argentina, for their cattle show. And I spent nearly a week with Tom. We, we spent time at the show evaluating cattle, meeting breeders, discussing Angus cattle, studying pedigrees, studying cattle. After the show, we had the opportunity to go out and make some herd visits and, and do some things that, that you just, having time along, took it to another level for me. When he's a walking encyclopedia on, on those different pedigrees and willing to share his opinion, and Tom has probably seen more cattle, Angus cattle, not only in this country, but in countries throughout the world than any other single person. And, and on a personal note, I truly appreciate the, the guidance Tom gave me in my family in this project that we've we ventured into in terms of bringing some Angus cattle up out of Argentina and starting our, our operation here in the United States. And for that, Tom, I, I thank you very much, and, and we're excited to have you. Thank you very much, Dale. I'm honored to be a part of this. Now, Tom, well, let's, let's start off, and, and we're talking about the history of the cattle show ring. Let's, let's go to, to one of the, the biggest shows where it all started, if you don't mind giving us a little bit of history and, and where you think things got started. Well, Dale, I think when you analyze the cattle industry and the enthusiasm and excitement it's caused, I think you have to start in this continent at the International Livestock Show in Chicago, Illinois. This is an event that started in 1900. It ran through 1976, which was a 76-year run. And it probably was the biggest, most exciting livestock event I've ever been to in my life. It was a time when anything that happened at the International during it was held every year during the Thanksgiving weekend in late November. And anything that happened there had an effect throughout the year in the purebred industry, whether it was hogs, sheep, or cattle. And this event terminated in 1976. At that time, the event basically moved to Louisville. At to the, what then was called the North American International Livestock Show. But the thing you want to remember 
that there were two internationals because in 1974 and 1975, Louisville and Chicago both had an international. So the last international in Chicago was in 1975, and the first international in Louisville was in 1974. So if you look at it, these events con are considered to be what I call them brothers, maybe even embryo brothers, as you analyze this. And these events had, had, had a tremendous impact on the kind and quality of livestock that we bred over the years. Probably more of an impact uh, during the up until the 70s. And then we got into what I call some performance units, and it kind of changed a little bit. But livestock shows have still had a tremendous impact on the type of livestock that we breed today. Excellent, Tom. And, and that, that, that intrigues me. I was a very, very young child when my brother and sister were showing at the Chicago International. And I attended as a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old. It, 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 I wasn't very old. Uh, when I was going up there, and I, and I honestly can don't know that I have a memory of it, but I remember looking back at some of those pictures, and it it's quite the event. And I share the same interests that Tom does in terms of the history of, of of livestock, and I get into all the old breeders' gazettes, and I love seeing pictures from the Chicago International. What I I think was really special, and I I, I wish I could have had the experience there, Tom. But maybe you can you can share with us. When that livestock show was at its peak and everybody's coming in from, from wherever throughout the country, tell us about the, the numbers of livestock or the number of people or, or and maybe, and I don't even, I'm just looking at pictures. In some of those pictures, do you have several hundred people watching a show that have a sports jacket and or tie on? I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I think, an event that a lot of our younger generation can't even imagine. Well, Dale, you know, the very first international livestock show in 1900, the grand champion steer was a steer called Advance. He was bred by Woodlawn Farms at Creston, Illinois. That was the Pierce family. And the unique thing today is that farm is still in business, and the barn where uh, Advance was fitted is still being used. So that makes it pretty historic. But going on about the international, you know, at that time, prior to, I would say, about 1979, you only had three breeds of cattle that were shown. You had Angus, Shorthorn, and Herefords. And it was, it was kind of the class event of the year. Everybody got all dressed up. They wore their hats, and ladies uh, wore their best dresses. Men wore their suits and ties. And they were all decked out for the International Livestock Show. It was a class event because a lot of people showed there. When they selected the grand champion steer, I would the international amphitheater. I would say that it was it was it was packed. And of course, I think the interesting thing is it's the same international livestock show where in 1952 uh, Dwight Eisenhower got the Republican nomination for president, and Adley Stevenson, who was governor of Illinois, got the nomination for the Democratic side. So both political nominations were held in that same building where the international was held. President Eisenhower on the, on the Republican side and Adlai E. Stevenson, the former governor of Illinois, on the Democratic side. So that was the International Livestock Amphitheater where all the shows were held on the, on the cattle side. And, you know, the classes were huge. You know, today they kind of break classes by ages and maybe they, sometimes they break them by height or weight or whatever they might be. But back then, they showed, them, they showed them in what I call clumps. They'd show all the January, February, and Marches together. So one class, there might be 60 head. So the, the classes were huge. And, you know, in one class of steers at the International in the 50s, there were 75 head that created in one class. And that was after they'd done the sifting. See, at the International, they used to have a sifting committee where you'd have to take your animal before a, a committee of three, and they would evaluate and decide if that animal had the right breed character and if he was of the superior quality to be able to enter the international show ring. So you had to go through a sifting before you got to a show, and I mean, for the show. So a lot of times there was still uh, 70 to 75 head in a class. And the international was 
done long before I was born, but I have seen pictures and read lots about it and heard several different people describe it. And it just seems like an event that was just so unique and so special. And when you look at those pictures of all how everyone was so dressed up and uh, you could just tell just even in still photographs that it was just a world class event. And I, I really wish that we could just go back in time just a little bit and have something like that again, because I, it, it made an impression on me just looking at the pictures and hearing the stories from several people about it and just truly something that seemed amazing. Ryan, you made reference to the Breeders' Gazette. Uh, here at the American Angus Hall of Fame, we have a complete set of Breeders' Gazette from when it started in 1881 through the last issue in 1956. And keep in mind, this came out every week. So we have them all bound. So it's given me a real opportunity to study the international from the standpoint of pictures and really keep abreast of it. The, the other thing that happened after the international livestock show, they used to put an album out every year from the year of 1900 to 1955. The last 20 years, they didn't put out an album, but they put out an album every year, a hard covered album that told how every entry placed. And I'm fortunate to have a complete set of those albums here at the American Angus Hall of Fame. So I am real proud of that. And it gives me an opportunity to stay tuned at, on things that happened at the International. But sometimes you say, well, you're living in the past. Well, maybe we are just a little bit. But you know, when you think about something really special, and you think about how it reflected the type of cattle that we were breeding at the time. When you take the international from 1900, basically from 1900 to about, I would say, 1941. Now, keep in mind, there was no international livestock show for a, a few years. That was 1914 and 1915. That was because of World War I. And then from 1942, 43, 44, and 45, because of World War II. But the international really set the tone of the kind of livestock we bred. So from basically 1900 to the early 1940s, we were breeding livestock that had what I would call frame and growth of muscle and meat. They were what I call a very good utility product for the time. And then after World War II, hang on to your hat. Because I tell you what, it was the baby beef era. So basically, from about 1945 through 1968, we went through a baby beef era, where the smaller the better. In fact, they were breeding cattle, feeding cattle, the carloads, they were all belt buckle high. And kind of what created that, there was a gentleman from the state of Kansas named Dr. Arthur Weber, and he judged the International in 1948. And he judged until the, the kind of the mid fifties. He judged the steers every year, and he was a he was a baby beef creator. He loved baby beef, and he the smaller the better. He he would make them champion, and so that really set a tone. And then watch out, because came along 1969, and enters Don Good again from Kansas State University, and that was the first time that crossbred steers were permitted to participate. And here comes Conico. He is a Charlet sired steer out of an Angus cow. And he really upset the apple cart because uh, he was kind of basically that, you know, prior to that, there'd been some, what I call Angus kind of crosses that maybe won, but this was really revolutionary when this Conico hit the scene. I mean, there was pandemonium at the show the day. I, w I had a front row seat that day, 1969. I'll never forget it. Uh, Dr. Good, uh, he was on a mission. And he went out there and he made Conoco Grand Champion. And I tell you what, it turned the world upside down. Because from that point then, we started to move towards cattle that were bigger and growthier. This was 1969. And then we advanced towards the 1980s. When we got them so tall, we couldn't see over them. 
And then we decided we had to shift gears again. And then we went back and have since that time had more what I call moderate sized cattle uh, that uh, that had more value and more use in the in practical terms. You know, Mr. Burke, you were talking about that there's large classes at the international and uh, that there was a sifting committee. I just can't even imagine having a sifting committee at a major show right now. Uh, I mean, I, was there ever any controversy with that? Did people get upset if they got sifted? Because if that happened today, I, I just think that that would be a lot of drama. I, I tell you what, it was loaded with drama because uh, this sifting committee, you know, they, uh, they, 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 their credentials were probably maybe a little bit, let me say, biased. So you had to be you had to be kind of on your toes. You had all your T's and I's dotted and crossed, uh, and it may even affect who you sent your steer out to be sifted in front of. I mean, there, you talk you talk about controversy now. Uh, it wasn't short of that. Uh, they might say that this steer doesn't look enough like a Herford or an Angus or a Shorthorn to be here, and so there was a, there was a, there was a lot of trauma. And Tom, I can't even imagine going going through and, and being able to to witness some of those things. You talked about the different types. We went from the baby beef and, and more practical and then really big and tall. And obviously, it, in in my opinion, and listening to you, it was certain judges that pushed us in those directions. At that time, did that influence maybe back to, to other purebred operations that would filter into the commercial world? Did the commercial world follow what was going on in the show ring at all, or is there any correlation at that time? You know, the commercial guys, they were very grounded. They knew the kind of cattle they needed to raise to make the payments. So consequently, they, they didn't quite fall into that vice in the 80s of what I call these sky-high seed stock bulls. These bulls were so tall. That you could, if you go back and look at the pictures in the 80s, they were so tall you couldn't see over them. They didn't have any depth of rib and capacity, and they didn't have any fleshy knees. So I'd say that it was a, it was more uh, ornamental and uh, more in the show ring because most commercial guys, they stayed pretty darn grounded and uh, stuck to, to what they believed. Excellent. So the show ring would come up and down and hit the, hit the commercial guys sometimes on, on the way by. Yeah, and you know the good thing about it when a lot of seed stock producers were raising these cattle that were probably uh, too big for a lot of us, uh, there was a few guys that uh, didn't fall into that, and so they really enjoyed. Well, let's let's let's, let's mention a few names. You take back in uh, 1969 when the Conoco uh, was the uh, Grand Champion of Chicago. I used him as a barometer. Because he kind of set up the tone for what was happening in the seed stock nursery. People were kind of discontent that they didn't have, that they, there wasn't enough poundage to sell. The cattle were too small. They were too early maturing. They wanted some bulls that had some grow and would get to have some pound. Well, as it would be, and I'm going to speak now on the Angus side of the aisle, there were some herds that, that had bigger type Angus cattle. And one of those herds was the Erdman herd in Watonka, South Dakota. They were breeding bigger type Angus cattle. So they had, in the 60s, they had a field day from the standpoint of selling bulls that had more frame and growth. Another place would have been the Bonview herd in South Dakota. They had the 1969 International Grand Champion Bull Great Northern. And his progeny were really sought after. And then you had a group of breeders in Western Canada. In Western Canada in the 60s, uh, I, I, I would guess there probably was probably 1,500 to 2,000 head of Angus seed stock coming down a year for the United States of America, particularly from the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. These cattle were bigger type Angus cattle. There was a bull called Canadian Colossal. There was a lot of Eston bred cattle. Canadian, a lot of breeders went up and bought a Canadian bred bull. And then there was the Y Plantation over at Queenstown, Maryland, really owned by Arthur Poot, 
owned the herd. And then Jim Lingo was the manager. And they had cattle, again, that had more frame and growth. Uh, they were people that believed in weighing and measuring. In fact, the, the Y prefix didn't really get much respect until uh, the 1960s uh, because they had cattle then that people needed. And then we swing down into Oklahoma. And that was a real hotbed for emulous bred cattle and big Alvin cattle. There was Carlton and Murray Corbin. And there was Bob Hartley. Uh, there was uh, just a host of guys, Dr. Hall and G.C. Richardson. Uh, these were the gentlemen that had bred emulous bred cattle. Uh, they weren't able to sell them very well. But once the type change came, man, they were on top of the world. And then there was the big Alvin cattle that went back to the International Grand Champion Bull of 1951, Alvin Bartlier III. Uh, those cattle had got some bigger females crossed in the bottom side of their pedigrees, and they became uh, a, a fluid uh, group of cattle in the Angus industry. So the, basically the whole pedigree thing changed in the Angus breed at the beginning, at the, in the beginning of the 1970s. When you had the Western Canadians, you had the Big Albans, you had the Amulus, you had the Y. Uh, you just had a host of new genetics, and thank God they were there and had the seed stock that had more growth and performance in them. I had these discussions with you when we were in Argentina, and I, I remember several of them. And, and going back to that, the dynamics that are out there, and I had a, had several people ask me is, do you, what do you see for shorthorn cattle or what do you see for Herefords when you travel outside the country and specifically Argentina? And the fact that we had breeders in, in Canada and breeders in the U.S. that maybe didn't follow the baby beef and we maybe didn't go to the, the extreme, tall, harder doing Angus cattle there for a while. The fact that some of those breeders stayed committed to what they wanted to do allowed us to go back and, and bring it back to reality. And it's interesting to me that just think if all the breeders would have went the same direction that the show ring was at that moment and gave up all those other cattle, what happens? See, once again, I use the international as a barometer because, see, you got to remember, this is before there was any genomics. When I, when I was a young child and we would go to a field day with my father and they would talk about performance, well, the first thing somebody would pipe up and say, well, I had a 98% calf crop. That was my that's that was the first definition of performance. What was your percentage of calf crop? And if you bred your heifers as two year olds or three year olds, that was the conversation at field days. And there used to be every state would have a field day, and it was always a family affair, and you'd go to it. But that's what they would talk about. And then as things kind of revolution along along and came along PRI, then they started talking about herd classification. Well, I classified my herd and I had 30 excellent cows and I had so many very good. And then now all those things came to a halt and then people got a scale and they started getting weaning and yearling weight. And that re American Angus Association started the AHIR program and the performance thing was off and running. But prior, but prior to that, there wasn't any of that type of performance that you could use to promote your animals. The thing that made these shows so popular was it was a great way prior uh, to the performance movement to promote your cattle and get them out in front of people and let other people see them. So, Mr. Burke, of all these trends and different things that you've seen over the years, and I mean, it has changed a whole lot. What do you think has been the most successful pivoting point in this industry that is gone on to make it as competitive as it is now, especially in terms of junior shows. I just think right now more than ever, it is just so competitive at the top end. And I just would love to get your feedback on how you think we got there. And was there one or two things that made it progress towards this level? Well, Ryan, I think today that junior shows are the most competitive events in the livestock industry. Whether you go to an Angus event, a Herbert event, a Shorthorn, or whatever it might be, I tell you what, when you get into the top end of those shows, 
It's like being in a swimming pool with alligators. Because I tell you what, the competitive spirit and the goodness of the cattle. And I think I think I think what's created this is a family togetherness. I think I think the livestock industry is something that a family can do. And you know, you've got you've got the children, then you got the parents, and a lot of times you've got the grandparents. And you know, when you get three generations, it's a way for three generations to work together and have a wonderful time and have that family venue and brings them together and working together and and then once they get into it, you know, they may go to a couple of shows and they may stand sixth or seventh. And then granddad says, that's enough of this. We're going to get something that we, that Sally can be at the top of this class. If we're going to go to these things, we're just not going to go to participate. We're going to go to win. And so this has caused a lot of excitement. Uh, and because, you know, these, these young exhibitors, they get to go out and work with their animals. And if you know, if you're a junior exhibitor, you've got to love it because you've got to work with that animal basically 365 days a year. And I think uh, mom and dad have found this a good way to make their children good citizens. They learn about livestock. They learn about winning and losing. And I think this is what's made it so competitive. But getting back to the question you asked about what has made it this way, I think that uh, people put so much effort and so much energy into these junior projects. I just announced the Eastern Regional 48th Annual uh, Angus Show in Lebanon, Tennessee. And that was last weekend. And I don't think I ever seen as much enthusiasm, excitement, and energy put forth, not only by the exhibitors, but by their parents and their grandparents and the show officials. I, I think it's just something that uh, it's made a stronger America. Now, let me, let me just take you back to this. If you went to an open class show, let's say back in the 60s, I tell you what, the juniors would just get thrashed and they'd be bringing up the bottom of the class just as predictable as you can imagine guess what happens today when you go to denver when you go to the north american the all-american security the nash or wherever open shows you may choose to go to i tell you what if you're going to win the class and you're you better figure out how you're going to beat the juniors because i tell you what they've really stepped it up and I tell you what, they bring a tremendous amount of competition because they're ready and they're ready to go. And uh, if you think you're going to uh, beat them, you better be prepared. That is so true, Tom and, and Ryan. I appreciate the direction you're taking that. And it is so competitive right now in, in that junior ring. And I, I think we've we've we have changed focus. And, and I think as as Tom's talking about, you've got the juniors to compete with, and they're out there at the top end. And, and I think we've evolved into just that, where we're really, really focused on, on maybe building the kids and, and the livestock. I don't want to say they're secondary, but obviously we talk about this on a regular basis, that the values and, and everything that this brings to those junior exhibitors by working with that stock day in and day out and getting a chance to travel with their family across the country, there's more benefit there than, than we have time to even cover. So it is, it is very interesting how it continues to maybe change focus, but I would say the show ring right now in terms of numbers and because of all the juniors across species, we're probably showing more livestock today than we ever have, even though it's maybe taken a different direction. So all of that is that is exciting for me, and I, I hope it continues to go that way. One thing, Tom, we haven't addressed yet is you've been a sale manager for 50 plus years. I'm, I'm just estimating there. And you get to see a lot of the country and experience a lot of things. And I know it's obviously been focused on Angus sales. And we're in a, a pretty troubling time right now with the pandemic and some issues that we're having with with politicizing just about everything we can and, and racism and lots of things going on in the world. And it's maybe slowed some things down because of COVID-19 and some shows being canceled. But it looks to me like the sales are still going. 
that those out there in our industry are finding a way. If if one show's canceled, another one pops up. You you've done a lot of traveling, and I had one of your coworkers that was actually a former student of mine, Jeremy. He wanted me to ask you about a, a trip that he thought we might enjoy. You might enjoy sharing that story when you were trying to get, I believe, to an Angus sale when the events of nine eleven took place. Do you know what he's maybe referring to on that one? Yes, I, I know exactly. Uh, the day that the planes flew into the World Trade Center in New York City, I was in my motel room in Bashaw, Alberta, Canada. And, uh, you know, I watched the first one and I thought, oh, my gracious, look at that. And then I saw the second one and I saw how serious that was. And then I thought, oh, well, I better be getting home because I'm out of the country. But all of a sudden, I discovered there was no getting home. And this was in the early part of the week. And I had a sale that latter part of the week in the state of California. So basically what I had to do, I had to figure out how I was going to make my journey across the border. They said you couldn't get across the border. I called about some flights and there was no flight. So what I basically did I, from, from Canada, I, I, I took a train to the border. And then from the border, I took a taxi cab. And then I took a rental car. And then I had to go over uh, some body of water. So I took a boat. And so finally, I got to Northern California. But it was quite a task because it took me four days to make that journey. Uh, and, uh, but I did get back to the United States and I did make the sale. <laughs> Excellent. And I'm obviously you've, you've traveled and, and has seen as, as much of the country and internationally on, on the Angus stage. And there's a couple more things I want to, want to bring up on that. When you look at where, where we're at in the show ring, and we've talked about how it's, it's gone through the different trends and the, the Chicago international and how we've, we've evolved into a really junior dominated show stock industry right now you've probably traveled as many shows outside of our country as any where's the rest of the world at are we are are we seeing them doing similar things are they going their own direction what what is what is your your input there for those that would have a chance to to travel into these other countries and and visit these these livestock producers and and watch some of these shows well i think the first thing i want to say is that I firmly believe in my heart that in the United States of America, we have the best Angus breeders in the world. Because regardless of where you go, and he, I've been able to see Angus cattle around the world. And most of these other countries, you'll find that these Angus cattle in other parts of the world carry from 50 to 90 percent of United States genetics. So let's just start from the United States and go north to Canada. Canada is really, they've got a lot of really great Angus breeders. They're breeding Angus cattle much the same as we are. Maybe they're breeding them a little different because they're not quite as hung up on these this performance as we are in the United States. I didn't say performance was bad, but they're, they, they still consider a lot of phenotype in their selection. So I'd say that Canada is really breeding some great Angus seed stock. And then we go across the land to the UK. And that would really be alarming. Because in the UK today, they want cattle that are nine and ten frames. The bigger, the better. I never. I was over at the show in Edinburgh, Scotland, at the Royal Highland, uh, not a few years ago. Well, uh, two years ago. And I was amazed how big the cattle were. These cattle were, they had what I call stovepipe bone. They were huge. And the reason that they had a reason for this, because uh, they, they, they get a subsidy for pounds of beef per acre. So consequently, they were very enthused about them being larger. And basically what they did, they, they, they siphoned off all of our big genetics of the 1980s in the United States and took them over there and they made them even bigger. Now over there, there's a couple of herds of what they call native cattle. And uh, that's very interesting. Jordy Suter 
has a, a set of Angus cattle that are straight Scots. They're just like from the mother church. They have no invasion of any other blood than Scottish bloodline. And I, we did a sale for him. It was very successful over in Scotland. And he's been a successful breeder. And then you swing south and you go down to Argentina and Brazil. And you talk about some dedicated, devoted cattle breeders. They're probably the only country that could give us a lot of competition today from the standpoint of seed stock. Unfortunately, because of the hoof and mouth, we can't bring them up here unless we come through Canada or some other venue. But I tell you what, there's some great cattle. Now, the amazing thing is when you go down there is, is how strongly U.S. bred they are. They, there was a bull called Nichols Formula. He was used with great success. And in the early 70s, they bought a lot of great bulls from Sir William. And prior to that, they bought bulls from Ankeny in New York. And prior to that, they bought bulls from Home Place in Missouri. And prior to that, they bought bulls from the Perth Show in uh, Scotland. And that's when those cattle were what I call toned down. And so they're really making some progress. And then you swing across and you go into New Zealand and Australia. And, you know, they're really foot conscious. Uh, they, they're raising some really super good cattle that I think it will have a real effect. And again, they carry a tremendous amount of U.S. genetics. And so I'd say that the, the general atmosphere of the Angus community is progress and prosperity. I just think your wealth of knowledge is just amazing and so many different things that you've got to see and witness. And I know that uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic that we're in right now has really affected the livestock show industry in a real huge way. And we're all still trying to figure out where we're going to go from here. But other than right now in this area, have you seen anything else that you think has had a similar impact at all or is just by far the most, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's been devastating to the shows that you've seen? Well, I, I wasn't around uh, to remember World War II when, you know, there was a slowdown of the U.S. But I think this COVID-19 has been devastating from the standpoint of our livestock shows. But, you know, I feel good because we as Americans are resilient. And we're going to figure out a way to make this thing work. We're not going to let us get us down. It, it, it might get us down to what I call a stroll. But we're going to be back running before you know it. So I say give us a year to kind of get mended up. And Katie, by the, bar the door, because we're going to be back full speed ahead. This is so true, Tom. And we look at some of the what we call the backyard shows that are just a, a, a junior market show that will pop up and announce for a couple of weeks that we're going to have a show at this destination. And there may be 400 hogs show up. So, I mean, people are ready to go and, and we're getting that done. And I could not agree more as we open back up and COVID-19 settles down, I think we're going to see as much enthusiasm and excitement in this industry maybe as we ever have. And it's, it is a good thing. It's, it's a good thing that we know that the people out there want to get out, they want to show, and they're finding ways to do so. So that, that's, that's all extremely important that we, we hang in there and we find a way and we, we keep moving forward. I enjoyed some of your stories when we, when we took that trip to Argentina very much that, that you told to, to some of the people down there, and I had the privilege to listen in. You mind, Tom, sharing a story with us that uh, at some point you're going to become a little closer to George Grant? <laughs> well, I hope it's not too quick. I hope not as well. well. I'll give you a little background if you want to hear it. The very first Angus cattle came to America in 1873. That basically was 147 years ago. And, you know, these were four Angus bulls that were loaded on the battleship Alabama. They came from Glasgow, Scotland. They came across the Great Atlantic, and they landed in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then they came up the mighty Mississippi by a riverboat. And then they were loaded into a wagon train. Imagine this, these four Angus bulls. 
And then they went across Missouri and they went across Kansas and they landed at a town called Victoria, Kansas in western Kansas, just off Interstate 70. And if you're ever going down Interstate 70 and you see the sign that says Victoria, slam on the brakes and go three miles south and see the beautiful Angus Monument that's dedicated to Mr. George Grant. George Grant was a Scot. He came to America and he had a desire to start a colony of Scots in Ellis County, Kansas. So he bought thousands of acres, brought the people over here, but then they had a, a drought and the people got discouraged and they went back. But back to George Grant, when he brought these free, he was the gentleman that saw these bulls in Scotland and he brought them over. And when these bulls arrived, they were probably pretty tired, but their enthusiasm was still good because they saw these long horned females with great big racks that reached to the sky and all colors of the rainbow. And these bulls went about their work. And they bred these longhorn females. And guess what? Nine months later, the miracle was born. Because the calves were solid black for the most part. And they were poles. And that was the beginning of the Angus cattle as we know them in the United States of America. But fortunately, the best was yet to come. Because the following year, they put these calves on grass. They fattened on grass, took them to the Kansas City market, and they topped the market. But you know how peculiar it must have been to see these black calves and predominantly, in fact, not predominantly, solidly, they were Herefords and Shorthorns. So they took these two bulls in the fall of 1873 and put them on display at a livestock show in Kansas City. People called them freaks and made fun of them. And these were two of the four Angus bulls. And then 10 years later, the American Angus Association was established. And, you know, the good thing that happened, it took from 1883 when the association started until 1947, 65 years for us to register our first million head. And today, we as Angus breeders register a million head every three years. But over at this uh, monument, I got a little off track here. Over at this monument, there is a gentleman buried there by the name of George Grant, who brought these first bulls to the United States of America. So when I was over there one day, uh, there's a nice bull on top of a monument. And I got looking around and I said, you know, when I pass on, this might be a good spot. And so when I went home, I wrote a letter to the Kansas Historical Society and the city of Victoria and asked them if I could buy a burial plot next to Mr. Grant when that day came. Well, unfortunately, they thought I must be institutionalized because they thought it was the craziest letter they'd ever received. Well, so I called them up and finally I went over and met with them and they saw that I was fairly normal and we were able to strike a deal where I was able to buy a plot next to George Grant. So when that day comes and I pass on, I'm going to have the honor and privilege to be buried next to the father of our breed in the United States of America, Mr. George Grant. Tom, I, I love your stories, and I, I'm sure they did think you were crazy at first, but they, they realized your they your sincere desire and interest and in, that your life is is Angus cattle, and, and it's wonderful. So, Mr. Berka, I just like picking your brain. And so uh, what do you think is going to be the next trend, or what, what do you think in the future is going to be the biggest hurdles for us to, you know, overcome in terms of the livestock show industry? I think the first of all, we have to decide what's going to happen with this imitation beef, this imitation meat. See, I won't even go to a restaurant that serves it. But my own personal opinion, I don't think it's going to get off first base. Now, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's going to be like eating a piece of straw. 
I don't think it's going to be very tasty when you compare it to a, a certified Angus beef or something that's tasty like that. But I, I think the obstacles for livestock shows is keeping the credibility. You know, it gets so competitive that sometimes maybe some people want to take some shortcuts. And so I see keeping credibility and honesty in these shows as being extremely important. Because you got to remember, we're dealing with young lives and we're dealing with the future of America and the future of the livestock industry. Now, you'll say, well, these shows don't have anything to do with the commercial industry. But I tell you what, it opens the door for a lot of young people to enter the beef industry. Because from there, they may become a professor at a, of animal science, a judging team coach, have their own farmer ranch. They may manage a big feedlot. They may run a big commercial operation. I call it a swinging door that comes open to let people walk through and get themselves exposed to the livestock industry. And I tell you what, people that are in it have a great passion for it. And I think the best thing we got going for it is that anytime we have a family involved, we've got, as I say, three generations, Sally and Jeff, mom and dad, granddad and grandmother. And when you get that cheerleading section going of the parents and grandparents, I tell you what, there is no stopping it. But I think that we got to be careful with the credibility factor. We got to keep honesty. We've got we've got to do things right. And uh, I, I I think that the livestock shows, you know, some people will say, well, they're insignificant, but boy, they're not. I tell you what. People make lifetime friends. And I tell you what, this world and life is, a, is a, about friends and about happiness. Yeah, they create these alliances with their animals. And they learn how to work and treat people. Well, I just think that the livestock shows and especially junior shows, uh, you can't beat them. And I, I, and I tell you what, as I say, I don't know of any better way to raise a family and for togetherness and working together than being involved in a livestock family. Well stated, Tom, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with, with the direction. And, and we're going so strong until COVID-19 hit, and we're still going, and we're still working our way through this. But I see the future is as bright as ever, especially for the junior stock shows. You addressed briefly there our imitation meat or fake meat, and I made myself go to Burger King and, and purchase an Impossible Burger because I wanted to, to find out what it tasted like. Is it something we need to be concerned with? Is it a true threat to the beef industry? I tried not to be biased. I consumed several bites. I, I, I didn't, didn't like the taste. I didn't like the texture. However, it concerns me because there is a segment of our society that would prefer to go that direction. I hope it's a small segment. And I hope it stays that way. But but excellent insight in, in terms of, of the direction that, that we're going, and it's, it's been good. Tom, in, in all your travels, and we're going to try to, not going to keep you on here all day, but I'd like to at least get to one more little topic here. In all your travels, I'm sure you've run into some fairly famous people in and out of the Angus business. Are any of those stories that you'd like to share with us? Well, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have uh, been able to work with a lot of people. Over the years, I mean, just uh, people that have bred Angus cattle or have been involved in the industry. I was fortunate to have met and did a sale for the late president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, at his farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I did uh, 35 sales for Senator Albert Gore and his son, Vice President Albert Gore. I did sales for uh, and worked with Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childress of NASCAR fame. So I was proud of that. I uh, did a sale for country music star Johnny Cash. Uh, did a uh, an event with uh, uh, Bob Hope. And so, you know, I, it's given me an opportunity to be involved. Uh, in fact, uh, 
just for your information, there was a famous bull called Brose Power Drive. And his grandmother was bred uh, by the famous uh, New York Yankee player and manager Billy Martin. She was a Pathfinder cow. He named her Martin's Alba 116. So he was involved in the Angus uh, industry. So I've had an opportunity to be uh, deeply involved with uh, the, the Angus breeders. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I think that uh, really made the Angus breed strong is certified Angus beef. And, you know, we're talking about this imitation beef. And, you know, last night I was here at the American Angus Hall of Fame and there's a house down the road and they were, they were, they were cooking some steaks. And I walked outside and I could smell the aroma of the steaks. And I thought to myself, boy, wouldn't I like to get invited to come over and eat with those folks tonight? Because I tell you what, there's nothing that smells better than uh, steaks being grilled outside. And, you know, and we talk about certified Angus beef. You know, that was started in 1968. And uh, last year we had the fortune of selling 1,250,000,000 pounds of certified Angus beef around the world. So I tell you what, uh, I think the beef industry is in strong hands. I think we have to do everything we can to protect it, but I think I think we've got the I think we've got the manpower and the force to do it. Tom, I I so appreciate your enthusiasm and your contribution to the stock show industry, and and very much thank you for that. And thank you for joining Ryan and I today on on our Beyond the Ring podcast. And I look forward, hopefully, to spending some more time with you and maybe bringing you back on to expand a little bit further and, and maybe more specifically into the as we dive into the Angus cattle. But until next week, happy days. Well, I want to say thank you and I've got good news for you. And I've enjoyed it more than you have. I was honored and privileged to be on with both of you. And I want to say thanks for the invitation. Happy days. Well again, Mr. Burke, thank you so much for coming on here and uh just sharing just a little bit of your knowledge with us because again it is just amazing to hear all the things that you've got to witness and see in this industry and truly a treasure to have you on beyond the ring thank you very much